Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Beneath the Surface, our monthly talk series from the Australian National Maritime Museum. My name is Megan, and I am the Digital Education Project Officer here at the museum, and I'll be your host today, speaking from our beautiful Maritime Museum uh, in Darling Harbour, which is Gadigal land. On the behalf of our museum, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay our respects um, as the they are the traditional owners of the land, the Badu and the, um, the Bamal, the land and the Badu, the waters on which we work. Um, we also wish to acknowledge all traditional custodians of the lands and waters throughout Australia and pay our respects to their elders past and present as well as their culture. Now, Beneath the Surface is a series of talks where our curators can discuss their research. And it's an absolute joy today uh, to have Kaylee with me. Um, Kaylee is an early career assistant curator of special projects. She has a Bachelor of Marine Science and over a decade of art training that she combines um, and brings together to her work, which at the moment is focusing on marine science communication. Um, today's presentation by Kaylee will last around about 40 minutes or so. So we'll have plenty of time at the end for some questions and discussion. If you have any questions, please, throughout the presentation, feel free to pop them in the Q&A box um, where we will be able to have a look. And um, at the end, I'll ask those questions uh, to Kaylee for our discussion. Um, so I'll now ask Kaylee, you can pop your camera and microphone on. And I think we're all good to go. Okay, so hello, I'm Kaylee, and um, I just wanted to start this talk with a quick poll. So if Megan could put up the poll, um, today's talk brings about a few different topics. So I was just interested to see in what brought you here today for this talk to set aside your time to listen to me speak about um, Valerie Taylor, about the ocean, the collection and acquisitions we do here at the museum. Um, we'll just give you guys about an, another like 45 seconds um, to do it there and just it's good for us to know so in future we can keep doing stuff that is of interest to you. So I'm a fan of the Maritime Museum, potentially not other. If you fit well into one of the other categories, that would be good and we can work with that in future. Yeah, so it's great to see we have a big variety of people um, attending the talk today. Um, a bit of a, um, a kind of, most people seem to have an interest in marine science, which is perfectly uh, suited for today's talk, as well as people just generally being a fan of the Maritime Museum and a bit of everything really. So um, yeah, I think it's, you can take it away, Kaylee. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, so um, a bit about me and why I'm doing this talk today. So I have been at the museum since 2019. I started here as a volunteer and then I began interning and I've been working on this uh, Valerie Taylor collection for about two and a bit years now. I studied a marine science bachelor and so I first was offered to come in and identify the species that were in the collection. You can see here on the photo in the left, um, they came in this form. They were 35 mil transparencies. And you can see around the outside are these mounts. They were either plastic or um, paper mounts. They had some information on them and they were in these slides. And then there was just a whole um, bunch of 10,000 of them put into boxes. So when I first started, I was just doing some identification and then I started doing some registration um, type work on them. And then I began helping to catalog them. And lucky enough for me, I then shortly became a curatorial assistant after that. And ever since then, I've been doing this as part of my work here. Um, and later on, I became an assistant curator of special projects, but mostly focusing on marine science topics that come up. 
So in that time, I've been doing other exhibitions and programs and mostly doing talks on the Valley Taylor collection, like you can see here. Um, this was at our Blue Solutions Summit earlier this year with Valerie herself being there. Um, and so I do research on the collection. I look at the stories behind the different images that we have, and I'm trying to piece together this big puzzle um, of the different dates and locations that are missing from some of the photos, as there have been many hands that have gone into this collection before we got it. Um, the last one, most notably, was her biopic that just came out and is doing really well on, on an international scale. And so it's a bit of a model when we got them. So it's our job now to categorize them and put them into a, a meaningful um, collection for people to have a look at. And I have worked personally with Valerie on my first actual day working here. Um, I met with Valerie which is a big first day. And then we have met a few more times to go through her collection and listen to her stories um, that we record then for our oral histories. Um, so a bit about Valerie. I'm not sure if everyone knows who Valerie is or you might just be interested in marine science. That's why you're here today. Um, we have Valerie here on the left and Ron on the right. So they are both they could have many titles. One encompassing one would be that they are underwater pioneers. They started off as spearfishers, uh, competitive spearfishers. They then moved on to filming each other underwater um, with animals. And then they started to get into real um, film and Hollywood filming. And then they became conservationists and started to take control of that story themselves. This is a general overview of the type of topics we have. I'm not going to go into all of them, but it's the type of images that we have either just from her travels um, of certain types of fishes or films that she's worked on, some from her personal life. Um, on this list, notably, we're not going to talk about um, much from Indonesia or Papua New Guinea, as some of those are culturally sensitive photos that we have, but there are plenty of other photos we're going to have a look at. And as well, I have put in three exclusive videos that were off cuts of her biopic. Um, they are not, to my knowledge, on the internet and they were given to us um, when her biopic came out. So they are also in this talk. And um, that's some videos instead of just photos that you guys can have a look at throughout the talk. So some context to why I think that this collection is special and important and sometimes rare is that it was very inaccessible to take these types of photos. So when Ron and Valerie were first taking photos in about the 60s, these were just um, film cameras that had roll film in them and they were not suited to being put underwater. So what actually needed to happen was that Ron, who was very creative and intelligent, um, he had to make these underwater housings for their cameras themselves. And as a note, um, Ron did pass away about 10 years ago and Valerie is still here with us today, if you don't know. So these uh, camera housings here on the screen, they, we have some of these in our collection and you have to make these individual to every camera because the outside casing has to touch each of the buttons that are on the inside of the camera so that it actually works when you're underwater. And this is why these photos are special because Ron was able to custom make these themselves and get over the gap of needing um, lots of money to be able to access equipment like this or to also make equipment that didn't yet exist. So the start of their story really as a couple is that they met during their spearfishing competitive days. But for Valerie, her um, fishing and kind of online, um, Ocean Journey started when she was about a teenager. Her father had a condition that meant that he wasn't very suited to eating red meat and he then needed other sources of protein. And so they didn't have a lot of money and Valerie then became um, good at spear fishing. And she was then able to go and fish for subsistence for their family and get um, fish from their local beaches and um, rivers for her family to eat. And then as time went on, she really enjoyed it as a hobby. And she then um, joined the spearfishing club. And this is where she met Ron. 
and um, there weren't many women uh, that were competing at the time. And so she was kind of in a male dominated area, which improved over the years that she was um, competing. Uh, so once she started competing, she um, was able to hang out with Ron a lot more. They both were actually traveling around Australia at the same time, going to interstate competitions. And then there was a period that they had both become national champions, uh, Bowie for the women and Ron for the men uh, at the same time. And in amongst all of that, they became a couple and eventually got married. So this is Ron during his competitive days. You can see he's a lot younger here. And this is an example of what those spear fishing competitions would have looked like. So I'm not sure if they still work like this today, um, but you can see the one here on the left is them measuring one of their larger catches. So that would be one category of just the largest catch. And then potentially these ones here on the right hand side are uh, also the number of fish that someone's able to get in a specified time. So what I'd also like to really show in this um, talk today is the other sides of Valerie that haven't really been uh, part of her narrative widespread so far. So there's only so many minutes in her biopic that they could show about her life, um, hence why we have some of these offcuts. And I also just wanted to show a different angle about Valerie. Um, I think that there is a narrative about her that is quite superhuman um, and a little bit untouchable um, but from my time with Valerie and reading her autobiography which is where a lot of these stories today come from and is also in our library that you can borrow um, it's also that she was quite human um, she had the same struggles as a lot of people she was not well connected um, she didn't have a special leg up to get into the industry and the type of work that she did um, she didn't come from a lot of money and she actually came from quite humble beginnings that aren't talked about as much, but I think speak very much to her character and to why she's so perseverant in her um, adventures so far and that she's still 86 and still dives and is still um, fighting every day for the ocean and that she still thinks that her work is never done. So part of her story that gets omitted is that when she was 12, she had polio. And so this would have been around the 40s and 50s. Uh, and at the time, it was a very fatal um, disease that didn't have a really good outcome rate. But Valerie is the type of person already shown at this young age. She was a fighter. And she um, relearned how to use her fine motor skills. And during this time, she basically could only really turn pages of books. So she spent a lot of time reading a lot of adventure and fantasy novels. And in her autobiography, she then, she says that this is the origin really of her adventurous spirit and wanting to be a large explorer in her life and having bigger dreams than the small um, beginnings that she came from. And another example of her just kind of being human and having the same struggles as many other people but overcoming them is that uh, Valerie actually had breast cancer and that is what our first um, video offcut is going to be that explains a little bit more about this. Hi there, Kaylee. Can you um, double check you've shared the sound of the video? When I first learned that Valerie Taylor had breast cancer, she said that this is the end of Valerie. That was the quote. I think she was terrified. It was something that she couldn't do much about. 
as opposed to being in the water with sharks that could kill you. She knows what to do. But the disease, I think it was terrifying because it was nothing to confront. And we all had to think, well, what does this really mean? Because we thought, you know, Valerie was indestructible. They tried different treatments. It was double mastectomy and as much arsenic and whatever else that they could give you to kill the cancer, not kill you. She beat it. It's a miracle she's still alive. Okay. Um, I hope that works. So another part of it is that Valerie is known for her work with animals, but through the photos that we have seen on here, I think it doesn't just involve marine animals. In general, we have photos like this with this emu and generally just, I mean, I really like underwater animals, but I don't have the same relationship with land animals, but Valerie seems to be able to get along with everybody. Here on the left-hand side, we have this turtle in the middle. We have this octopus with a large embrace. And on the right hand side, this sea snake, as well as this is a great composition. This um, cuttlefish is conveniently the same color as her wetsuit at the time. Something else that I think should be talked more about Valerie is her creative um, side. So she actually was very artistic and she was self-taught. This is the first job that she had when she first left school. She went into a film and animation studio and she was able to use her drawing skills to make money for a few years. Um, and this sustained her as she was finding her feet in the world. Here, I think this is watercolors. Um, we just have photos of the um, artworks, but not the artworks themselves. Um, and this style she actually used later in her own um, illustrated book that she created and wrote that has a spin-off of a coloring book as well. So between the films that she used to make, which would mean that she was away from her home for many months, when she would come back, she also used um, her artistic skills as a form of um, money that they could have uh, in between their jobs. So whether it was commissioning an artistic work or um, sometimes once she became more accomplished in her photography skills, she would then also sell some of those images to places like magazines. And this persisted into her um, filmmaking as uh, Ron was seen as one of the technical and handyman that made the camera housings, but Valerie was actually the person that was creating the narratives. So in their early days, when they were still um, up and coming in the filmmaking scene, Valerie would go and pitch their creative um, concepts to places like Channel 9. And if they liked them, they would then fund the films coming out. And so Valerie is not also just the person that was on screen and the feature, um, but she was also the creative, <clears throat> excuse me, um, push behind her and Ron's works as well. And you can see that this um, style that she had in here, similar to the um, book that she created, I think this only came out about two years ago. So in the spirit of adventure, we have a whole bunch of photos from things called freshwater ponds. So these are a phenomenon in um, our landscapes. We have some of them here in Australia, that these are a type of sinkhole the water pressure from underneath the ground eventually erodes um, up until the surface and it creates a freshwater pond. And then they create these sort of eerily scenes where they can have their own um, ecosystems in there um, of these freshwater habitats. So these are actually quite dangerous places to dive. There are still some of these parks existing like Piccaninny Pond, which is one of these images, um, is now a conservation park. And so it looks like this from the top. So only on the top here is where you will get sunlight. So it will be a direct shaft of light that will go down to the bottom. And so on the sides of that, you will be in pitch dark. So these places are actually historically quite um, dangerous areas for divers. 
um, people have um, passed away down there after getting disorientated. Um, if you move any of the sediment that's settled down the bottom, it can fill up the shaft and disturb your line of sight. Um, people have been disorientated and not been able to find the surface in time and unfortunately um, passed away in that manner. But Valerie and Ron were very skilled divers and they were very careful um, and they were able to navigate these areas well. Some of these photos um, and film was featured in their documentary series called Inner Space. And you can actually see in that film that they found some fossils down at the bottom of some of these caves of kind of kangaroo-like species. On the right-hand side here, this um, red thing is an underwater scooter. It helps you to navigate the water column a lot faster than just using your own legs. You can see it bigger in here. And in this vein of just adventure seeking, uh, Ron and Valerie were some of the first people to record some um, shipwrecks that had been found. They were the first to, I think, uh, photograph the Yongala wreck that's up in off of Queensland. They generally also just liked going to have conversations with locals and then go to explore places that they might um, have said. Sometimes people would think that those are myths, uh, but then they were able to discover some of those shipwrecks under the water. Uh, this is just an example of one of the boats and shipwreck photos that we have, these Japanese trawlers. And let's move on to filming. So Valerie had her own camera that she kept with her. Um, she took a lot of behind the scenes photos and um, took photos when Ron might be taking the main film that might be used for a documentary. Valerie also had her own water um, underwater camera and she was able to take photos whilst they were on their adventures pretty much everywhere. So one of their most notable films that they assisted on was Jaws. You can see here, this is a mechanical shark that was used for one of the Jaws scenes. Um, they were sometimes real sharks, sometimes not. So when it comes to the real shots, this is when people like Ron and Valerie were hired to do their work. So they were good at working with these animals. They knew where they were located around the world um, and they assisted on the boat trips that went out to go film the animals. Um, and sometimes they had to train the actors or the stuntmen that also were in the water. There's actually a scene where the conditions were too rough for the stuntmen in Jaws and Valerie is actually the one in the cage in the scene. Um, and it's actually her hand that ends up being in one of the scenes and not the stuntman, as he was too terrified in some of their conditions that they filmed in. Um, these are good uh, point of view shots. So we start from up here. This person would have been, sorry, Valerie, would have been from a boat. Uh, this is a great white shark that is being baited. Uh, they did bait for a lot of their shots and sometimes it took hours, days, weeks to get um, anything to bite or any sharks to come along. So once they did get the opportunity, they would bait them to keep them hanging around for longer um, to get the shot. This would have been from the top of the water. And this thing on the right hand bottom is the shark cage. You can see here the shark thrashing and going back under the water. And here in the shark cage, you would have had the videographer and the photographer in there. This is what it would have looked like from under the water. And you have your two filmers here. And obviously this photo was taken from outside of the cage. So sometimes Ron would get outside of the cage to get the shot. This wasn't always recommended, but he was very committed um, to getting the shot. And this is a great picture from within there of a great white shark. And Antarctica. So we have a lot of photos of under Antarctica, um, but the actual um, procedure was that these were basically six month shipping uh, trips. They would start from a place off somewhere in South America. And this was a form of income for Valerie and Ron uh, once they had built up their profile was that they would get um, hired to hop aboard these long ship or um, maybe like two to three week trips and people that had 
the ability to afford to go on these trips with them or maybe for sections um, would come on, they would um, run in Valerie, they would teach people how to dive, they would teach them about the ocean, they would host lectures on board um, and just get people into very intimate settings in the ocean um, via their help. So this is mainly for kind of very well-off people, um, including sometimes celebrities. Uh, one of the notable celebrities was Mick Jagger that was on one of these trips and that helped um, Valerie have a lifelong relationship with him. So the other photos that are part of this are also just the ones that are on the trip all the way down to Antarctica. So there are different islands or refuel stops that they would go to. Um, and then some of these photos are connected to those. But as an example of where the technology was in um, photography now, you have um, very big lenses and you have a lot um, clearer photography that you don't have to be as close to your subject anymore. I imagine that this photo, Valerie, would have been in the middle of an elephant seal pod um, or group of them. And this photo, she would have been relatively close uh, to have able to take it up at this um, degree near them um, while they were mid-fight. So it's a bit of a ballsy choice for her. Um, you can see that they're mid-fight um, for two young male elephants because of the nose um, and that it's almost not fully grown, so that's why they're a bit younger. And a safer option, I assume, would be like getting this photo up close of an adorable weddle seal. And I really like this perspective and I've used it in a few talks. And this is a Southern albatross, Royal albatross. And you might have seen them in documentaries before. And when they're shot, they're normally up in the sky. So you only have a big blue reference. And to me, they basically look like a big seagull. But here you can actually see that it's basically the size of a big prehistoric bird. Um, because now you have an animal with a two metre wingspan um, whose head is about the same size as Valerie's. Um, so for me, that finally put all of those documentaries um, into perspective. And Valerie is maybe my height, maybe about a metre and a half or a bit smaller. <laughs> um, so you can imagine the size of this bird. Another um, collection that we have are these turtles. And I gave, I put these examples in to give a idea of that some of these photos, they would have just been the perfect moment, the perfect time. Um, and you're dealing with wild animals and wild conditions that they're in. Um, I think this photo is just brilliant. You have this one moment um, and you have no editing. Uh, these photos are not edited on a computer afterwards. Uh, however the shot was taken that's what you got so for this to have lined up with the perfectly all black background um, to have got the total at all um, the chance sometimes they took so many opportunities to try and find these animals and unfortunately sometimes they didn't even get them after all of that time and investment so you have that they've got the animal they've got close up to it they have a beautiful clear background and this reflection that I really like um, that would have been a perfect moment for the water to have settled in this way. Um, and the turtle actually looking at the camera. And you have this photo, which would have been probably moments later, and it's still a great photo, but you have a different condition with the background and you've lost the element of the reflection. Um, as a diver, this is on my bucket list to see these leatherback turtles. So you've got just like rare encounters and for today, you'd be able to take a lot more photos within a short amount of time. Um, but for these, you only really had a few shots until you had to resurface and change your roll of film. So for example, there was a time when they were shooting um, and they would only be able to record about a min one minute of film before having to resurface. So they would have to be very choosy with their shots um, especially if you're going up to the surface and you're refilling your camera and you're potentially missing the wild encounter that you've been waiting all day or all week for. Um, so someone in today with this encounter in front of them, they could take maybe 60 shots within a few minutes. 
but I imagine that this was the first shot that she got. And then this one as a follow-up, maybe within the one minute. Um, and that, that was kind of like the best that they could get with the type of work that they had. So um, I think that makes them special that they really got the opportunity um, and the film and the resources all to work out um, in these moments and use them sparingly. We also have a small collection of whale and dolphin photos. I think these ones speak more to the way that Valerie works in the water. I imagine that this dolphin with this really lovely expression on its face um, is looking at Valerie, um, and that she is quite a good diver. Um, the more calm you are as a diver, the more skilled you are, you're able to just interact with animals a bit better or be more benign and let them um, just do their thing and do whatever they want and just be a great witness to them. Here she probably was near a whole pod of them that were able to just go about their business. Um, this pod of sperm whales, a very action shot you can see. And they just kind of look a bit mythical really. And here's them with the calf. So we have this group, um, they were called crustaceans. They're not necessarily all crustaceans, but they're in related families um, or basically code for small things. So I have another video that we can show um, that gives some more context to the um, technical side of taking these photos. Ron was always wanting new camera equipment. He made all his own houses. He was a genius. I'd say the cleverest man I've ever met. We did whatever we could to make a living out of what we loved to do. Valerie was very lucky during the photography days because Ron actually designed macro tubes for Valerie. The distance between the prongs is where you put your subject to take the photo. This gave Valerie the accessibility to take photos of little tiny creatures. And nobody really done this in any way before. Valerie was front cover of National Geographic with her macro kit. National Geographic is a big deal. They made that link for the public and for science and natural history, and they put it out in those publications, you know, in the, in the magazine. This was in 1972. I did my first National Geographic story on the Barrier Reef. They couldn't understand how I could do such incredible underwater macro. They'd never seen such photographs. So that was a good thing for both Rod and I. The art of photography it has progressed dramatically. At the same time, the opportunity to, for capturing these images has somewhat decreased because many of the places where she captured images, those animals, those reefs are now gone. Valerie's imagery represents a historical record of what there was at one time, and that's incredibly valuable. Valerie is living history. She saw the ocean when people first started having the opportunity to look at it. That is the only record we have of what the oceans were like in the 1950s. Now you can compare that to what we have now. If you were to shoot the same images in the same place, you'd see how, how little is left. We have no idea what the oceans were like 200 years ago or 2,000 years ago, except that we know they were a hell of a lot richer. At the time, she was the most famous female underwater photographer in the world, easily. And there was only 
maybe a, a dozen people in the world that could claim the kind of experience and fame that she, that she enjoyed. So it was appropriate she got multiple articles in National Geographic. She was doing things that nobody had done before. So um, to follow on what they were talking about, I think he misspoke with the decades, but maybe more around the 1960s and 70s are when the photos that we have um, are in our collection now, uh, the ones that she took. So the photos, this is a thing in science called like baseline data. So for all of the efforts for people to restore um, our ocean, we are trying to put it back to where it used to be um, and so we can't really base it off what it looks like today as they're already degraded um, so what has to happen is that we're trying to find references for what it used to look like in its prime um, which probably was before any humans were here but we're looking for you know the earliest um, recollections whether it be oral histories um, or visual that we can see of what it used to look like so we hope that in future we can have this collection contribute to marine science and conservation, um, which would be very in line with um, Valerie's hopes, um, that we can use them to show what places used to look like, because as they mentioned in the video, um, there weren't many people that were doing this. Um, and because of Ron and Valerie's experiences and access to things because of you know big budgets and whatnot, they were able to photograph places that didn't um, that weren't really seen by many humans. Sometimes they were very remote areas, um, pristine places that maybe only locals um, could tell them about. And so that's why um, some of these photos are special. And I hope with the right eyes eventually, maybe we'll even see new species that hadn't been recorded until this time um, or things like that. So as an example of the macro um, technology that was in that video just now, if you're not familiar, these are nudibranchs. They are a type of um, like a sea slug, marine mollusk. They're only maybe about two centimeters big here. Um, and this is a bunch of them. So you would have needed a good um, clear close up shot to get um, this type of detail. And here on the left, oh, sorry, on the right are their eggs, which are very aesthetic as well. Um, they are a venomous animal, and so the venomous animals are normally brightly coloured, um, and they're also sometimes quite ornate. So this is also a nudibranch here. More of these macro shots in our coral photo collection, but these hard corals here, as well as these soft coral polyps. So Ron and Valerie are also known for the shark chainmail suit that you can see here. We actually have one in our collection. So these were custom made for them um, in theory to protect them from sharks. The understanding at the time was that it was the power of the shark's jaw that is what um, ripped apart their prey. And so they put this mesh over their skin, um, which helped from the serrated teeth. And it was to be tested whether this shark um, jaw pressure was really a thing or not. So um, to do it conservatively um, at first, they got these custom suits made for each of them. And then they started testing it with um, smaller shark species. They started here with the white tip reef shark. As you can see, it's quite um, a small jaw size um, and kind of manageable for them to figure out whether it was really going to hurt or not. And you can see maybe in this right-hand one, um, they actually had to start baiting the sharks. Their experience was that the sharks were not aggressive. Um, they were not just coming up to them for no reason, um, as was the kind of understanding of, of that time and a bit like today. Um, they don't just target humans um, or especially go out of their way very often. And so they actually had to start baiting them to even get them to bite them to test out this theory. So they started with the smaller sharks and then they moved on to um, stuff like uh, wobbegongs, which are also here in New South Wales, as well as these gray nurse sharks that have a bit um, of larger teeth and a larger jaw. 
They then moved on to the blue shark that is in um, San Diego in the USA with a bit of a wider mouth. And you can see from the other hand that's hidden, she is actually baiting this shark. So um, if you've seen the biopic, this is also the scene that says the um, thumbnail of it. So you can see here this blue shark is already latched on to Valerie's arm and she had to entice the animal to come and bite her by baiting it with this piece of fish here in the front. Um, you can see the mouth is already on her wrist and she does not look like she's flinching. Uh, so through the work that they did, they basically uh, debunked that it was the power of the jaw and that it was really about the serrating of the teeth. And that's also part of them um, like kind of thrashing their body around so that they can tear apart their um, prey. And with Valerie's humour, um, she also decided to see if she could debunk another theory, which was that sharks were terrified of the banded sea snake. This is a venomous snake that's in the water. Um, it was, came up that a man thought um, that sharks would be warded off and scared by um, a mimicked suit of the um, skin of the banded sea snake. Um, so Valerie decided to test the theory out. Um, and in her experience, she thought it was all just <laughs> kind of a big joke. And she did not experience them being warded off. Um, they weren't necessarily enticed to come, but they, she was basically able to interact with them like she normally does from either a safe distance um, or intervening without much problem. And what she's most well known for is sharks, but she also has contributed to some very other notable wins um, through a lot of um, hard sweat and tears um, through her work. So she's also protected things like the fresh, sorry, the potato cod that are here in um, around Australia. Um, she's also gotten some areas to be protected with uh, like no fishing zones and things like that. And there is a marine park that is um, in their name, the, Ro the Ron and Valerie Taylor Marine Park that is commemorating some of the conservation um, goals and efforts that they've had. Uh, they also protected the grey nurse shark as well. Um, and there's an example of some of the work they did with sharks. This is our final video um, about the shark frenzies when they filmed. Well, I was 16 years old when I started working with them and we went out to Marion Reef to shoot shark frenzies. And I'm like, okay. We're chumming for sharks, you know, and hanging bits of fish over the side and they're tearing it to pieces. And Ron would say something like, right, I think we can get in now. And Valerie says, don't worry, little Neffy, it's gonna be okay. Now, we're gonna go down with the cameras and set up and you bring the baits down. And I thought they were absolutely insane. Yeah, it was uh, a little scary at times. Um, here we have examples of what some of those frenzies would have looked like um, from underneath the water. Um, this is where they would have baited. You can see um, in the right hand shot, they've got that fish just there um, baited close to where the right hand shark is. Um, and these are for smaller like reef sharks, not so much for larger sharks like tigers or great whites. This is an example of their oceanic white tip shark photos. Um, this is actually one of the most dangerous sharks um, that has been recorded. You can identify them by this um, rounded fin on the top of them over here. 
Um, unfortunately, it is known as one of the most dangerous sharks because um, of a few uh, isolated incidences that they had very large casualties um, in the water all at one time. This is a Port Jackson shark. Um, you might have seen them if you dive around Manly or Bondi. They are um, here along the New South Wales coast. They are quite small and they have quite tiny teeth that are just made for crustaceans um, to be chopped on. And this is my final example of just a point of view with our photos that I find um, interesting that we have these different angles in them that encapsulate kind of one moment in time. So uh, in this photo, you have Ron, he is filming a tiger shark, and this is Valerie's photo of him. And then you have what the shot would have actually looked like. So this is what um, Ron would have been taking. So that's basically the end. Um, we haven't run out of time yet, but in general, I also just wanted to say that um, we are working on digitizing the whole collection and that should be out maybe about next year. Um, and in the meantime, I'll be cataloging and researching um, and getting it ready to um, be enjoyed online, to be made accessible for everybody and for researchers in future. Thanks so much, Kaylee. I'm sure, well, I hope everyone else enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come through. And if anyone else has any questions about um, the Valerie Taylor Photography Collection, about um, her life or anything else um, kind of related, um, please pop them in um, the Q&A or the chat um, and we'll see if we can get to them all. Um, but we'll start with a couple that came in earlier. Um, the first one's from Dawn. Um, do you know of any marine species named after Valerie and Ron Taylor? You mentioned the marine park named after them. Um, no, actually. But I would be interested in seeing that someone with the right eye, because it does cover quite a lot of different species in this collection, whether this might be the first time that they've been recorded. Um, we have about 600 photos of nudibranchs. Um, and they're being um, identified all the time. So something like that, I hope, might have the potential to happen. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, and it definitely is something that um, a lot of research organisations um, are discovering hundreds and hundreds of new species every year in our oceans. And, um, yeah, definitely if we had more resources, we'd love to, I guess, have scientists and things who, who specialise in that. And these collections like this are really valuable. So in the future, um, let's fingers crossed. Um, here's another question uh, from Peter. So uh, did uh, Valerie and Ron um, document um, progress over time? So go back to the same places um, at multiple instances over the years? I guess that's part of what you're, the reason you're cataloging all of these different photographs. Um, so we're kind of filling in that information for her. Um, so we have photos from some places that she does go back over time. Um, for example, her um, one of her family members or friends, they opened up a place in Fiji that you can dive with um, sharks there. So she's got a lot of photos recurring of um, sharks or similar animals over the years. Um, and it would be my hope that we can make them more accessible in a format um, that we can then get them to be quantified over time. Um, she's also visited places like Papua New Guinea a few times that are also kind of obscure places. And even in my um, short time diving, I've seen certain places change within a few years um, of me diving. So I think there's a lot of potential to have seen those changes um, in all sorts of places all over the world in this collection. <laughs> Yeah, and also for future divers as well, um, you can kind of see what it was like when Valerie dived there and uh, we can see what it's like in the into the future as well. Um, and so here's another question. Uh, what sort of research questions are being, if any, are being um, asked of this amazing collection or could you imagine um, this collection diving into? Oh, um, so we have a UNSW student 
Um, she is looking at Seal Rock's photos at the moment for her honours uh, thesis. And she's looking at the potential of how to actually use these photos and other diver photos, um, also in combination with uh, research surveys that are being taken every few years in certain spots. Um, so she's having a look at kind of like a pilot phase of how to use these photos um, in future. Uh, other questions that she could have done were using our spearfishing collection. That's also a way of gauging um, what type of fish were in abundance during those years. Um, as well as um, just like certain species. So in seal rocks where Ron and Valerie have a home, we have a lot of photos from a seal rock specifically. Um, so they capture a lot of gray nurse sharks over and over again. So that's also a potential project that could be used um, or someone looking at like the nudibranch collection that we have um, and similar stuff like that. So if anyone is also interested, we did present at, um, a conference earlier this year and so we have opened up the ability for people to come and have a look at the collection before it's put online if that is a research area that you're interested in um, you can hit um, my email up later um, if you have any questions about it or interest yeah and another great reason why um, we put as much resources as we can into the digitization as well so that it's not just people who can potentially look at the hard copy hard copy um, photographs but researchers potentially across the world could utilize this collection in the future um, so uh, this is a question that goes all the way back to the start of your presentation um, so the first clip showed Valerie cutting away a net that had killed a shark um, does the collection also include non-natural aspects of the underwater world like nets, pollution, or, or seafloor damage um, caused by trawling? Um, yeah, we actually have um, two smaller folders. One is about um, shark finning and another is about um, pollution that has the ghost nets in it. Um, when Valerie's in certain countries, um, <laughs> uh, she's very, uh, she's not shy. Um, and she has got stories and we've got photos of her um, getting onto uh, illegal fishing boats um, and finning boats where she's taken photos of all of the fins that were racked up um, or of fishes that were uh, not practicing in um, legal ways. Sometimes she has hopped onto the boats herself um, to document some of these pictures um, and is hidden under some piles of um, fishing net and whatnot to get those photos. So we do have a collection of photos um, just from her travels where sometimes she's on land um, or the ghost nets and pollution stuff she has as well. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, here's another question, which is more of a museum-y one. Um, so um, what file format is the collection in and how does this impact conservation? So they were given to us as 35 mil transparencies. And so those have, I believe, acetate in them. So they are slowly um, degenerating over time. So we that's why we're digitizing them um, to also make them more accessible and to have a separate digital um, version of them and capturing them in the point that we have them um, now. So we have TIFF level uh, scans of the images themselves. And then we also have JPEG versions of the writing that's around some of the mounts. Um, sometimes it has dates or locations or a little bit of a story that's on them as well. So each one will have about two to three images per file um, and that's managed by us. And then our conservation team is um, also refiling all of the images and putting them into more long-term storage so that they um, minimize the degenerating of them. Um, and also they would need cold storage in future to slow that process down. All right. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll give it another 60 seconds to see if we get any last um, questions coming through. It's been an absolute uh, fascinating talk. Um, while we just wait to see if there's any last minute questions, I will mention um, that this is a monthly series and it's been really great to sort of see every month a different curator bringing um, their own kind of different stories to these talks. 
And next month, we actually have two um, from our team. Um, we have two of our museum uh, maritime archaeologists, uh, Dr. James Hunter and Kieran Hosty. And they're talking all about the Endeavour. Um, so Endeavour found presenting the evidence. Um, they will detail the research behind this approach and provide the evidence leading to the museum's announcement and um, of us finding the Endeavour or identifying the wreck of the Endeavour. And they'll discuss what the future might hold for the remnants of the Endeavour. This is, of course, the ship that Captain Cook um, sailed um, throughout the um, Pacific, um, around New Zealand and up the east coast of Australia. Um, so that's Tuesday, the 1st of November at 4 p.m. And you can find all the details on the museum's website and Eventbrite pages. All right, we do have one last question, and I know we've got a couple of um, questions there. Um, and Kaylee, I might just get you to select um, everyone in that um, chat box to make um, to if you want to um, let everyone know your email address if they have any uh, follow up questions. This is this last question is probably impossible to answer, but we'll give it a go. Roughly how many unique species do you think might be included in the collection? This is a great um, one to finish on today. I am not sure. I think we have at least maybe about a dozen different types of sharks to start with. Um, and then, I mean, we have about 600 photos of nudibranchs, so there could be a couple hundred in there. We have about 600 photos of different types of fish and rays. Um, so we're looking at like easily a couple hundred, um, which is also an opportunity for someone that would really like to do species identification um, if they'd like to come in and work on that for us in future. Um, if you Google my name, I can't put my, I tried to oh. put my email in, sorry, I can't do it. Oh, um, no, that's all right. I can pop that in for you. Okay, cool. There we go. Yeah, so if anyone wants to follow up on any, like, research things or if you just general have a question about it, um, yeah, feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, no worries. It's been an absolute joy um, hearing all about um, this amazing collection and the amazing life of um, Valerie Taylor and her husband Ron as well, um, a massive um, support, I guess, as well. So thank you um, to everyone for joining us. And we hope to see you again at another Beneath the Surface. Thanks, everyone. Bye.